Good evening, everyone. How's my audio manual? Thank you. Am I quiet? <clears throat> I can be louder. Oh. So I want to start by thanking you all for coming tonight from very far away. <laughs> uh, dear residents, and welcome Sonia and Hunt, who finally, after three weeks of quarantine, are in our midst. <laughs> Yay. It's such an interesting time of being so intimate. You know, this session is going to be a, an intimate session, just the resonance, um, but, uh, but also very expanded and wide. I'm not sure how many people are on right now. Maybe 500, 1,000? Yeah, it's close, close. Um, and, uh, and so thank you all for joining as well. And coming in towards Zendo. Um, if you want to join our session, which starts tonight, you can register and a link should be showing up on your YouTube page right now. Um, we'll be doing uh, three days, the next three days of plunging into the, the Zazen and the practice and study of the Genjo Koan. And, um, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What's your Genjo Koan is the title of my talk. So first, I want to apologize for talking about Dogen and the Genjo Koan because I'm not a scholar. I'm not an adept. I've uh, only read it a few times, and I'm just trying to share my own uh, enthusiasm and joy in reading uh, Dogen. So if I can convey my joy in it, then my job is done, and you probably won't understand anything more about Dogen. Um, and thank you to Roshi Joan, my teacher, who has uh, you know, taught me everything I don't know about Dogen. And uh, she's here on, on Zoom with us in our session and we'll be uh, co-leading it with Kozan and myself. And uh, I also wanna thank Kozan for his last week's uh, Dharma talk on Genjo Koan, Immediately Yourself, uh, which you can watch on YouTube at this link, bing. And, uh, <laughs> And he did a great job of kind of glossing the meaning of Genjo Khan and also going into the, the first uh, few sentences of it. And in it, he, um, he glossed it in a way with, based on these books, which he brought up. So I also brought them up to show that I've studied them. And, um, and I also brought up another book that he didn't bring up. This is the, uh, I'll talk about that later. You can get this. Uh, special book if you register for the session. It's not available on Amazon. Um, so what was I saying? <laughs> he glossed the, the word Genjo Koan, the title, um, which in, in Kaz's translation is uh, actualizing the fundamental point. And um, the, the two, the kind of the stream of translation of, of the meaning in these two books is something like the entire world as it is, is what is called Genjo Khan. So realizing reality, actualizing reality as it is. Uh, and he did a beautiful job of kind of taking us through each word. And so, um, but one of the, the question I asked Kozan during the talk was, well, this word an in Khan, and, and Wendy noted this when we first were looking at it uh, up at the refuge, an can mean to massage or that's kind of the literal meaning, right? Or to poke or point. Um, and so it's like, koan could literally mean massaging the absolute, massaging the absolute. And that's kind of the sense. I mean, it's, it's a joke, but it's also like, how do, we, how do we touch the absolute? How do we get it? Do we think about it? Or do we just plunge into it and just feel it with our, our own hands? So that's kind of one of what I want to do with you tonight is massage the absolute a little bit. Um, I guess another translation is realizing the absolute massage, but I think that's in incorrect, incorrect translation. Um, but uh, in addition to those wonderful things from Kozan's talk, probably the most provocative thing was his, his use of um, quotes about art and trading out Genjo Koan for art, which I thought was fantastic. And it's not just like, it wasn't just a game, it really meant something because art is like this, 
ineffable kind of indefinable thing that is actually really embodied, right? You do it with your body. And to me, that's kind of like practice and kind of like Genjo Koans. Like, what is this thing? We can talk about it and never make any sense, but maybe it's right here. We're doing it. So I think it does really work. And I, I found a few more quotes to, to continue the, the uh, practice from some people you might recognize. Genjo Koan is self-discovery. Every good practitioner practices what he is. Anybody know? Jackson Pollock. Genjo Koan enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. Thomas Merton. Now that's cheating because, you know, he's a Zen philosopher, monk, priest, but also an artist. All Genjo Koans are a kind of confession, more or less oblique. All practitioners, if they are to survive, are forced at last to tell the whole story, to vomit the anguish up. James Baldwin. The practitioner must create a spark before he can make a fire. And before Genjo Koan is born, the practitioner must be ready to be consumed by the fire of his own creation. Or his own Genjo Koan, you could say. Uh, Auguste Rodin. A real work of Genjo Koan destroys in the consciousness of the receiver the separation between themselves and the practitioner. Leo Tolstoy. So that'd be more like if you're dialoguing about Genjo Koan, does your study of Genjo Koan, does your discussion of Genjo Koan destroy the separation between yourself and other? Genjo Koan is standing with one hand extended into the universe and one hand extended into the world and letting ourselves be a conduit for passing energy. Albert Einstein. And finally, let's see if anybody can guess who this is. I am my own experiment. I am my own Genjo Koan. Madonna. <laughs> and that's what I wanna to discuss tonight. What is your Genjo Koan? What is your own experiment of yourself? How do you manifest? How do you actualize the reality of yourself? It's Genjo Koan. So um, I don't know about you all, but maybe people who are watching noticed that the title of my talk, what is your Genjo Koan? I know Remyo noticed because she put it in the newsletter. I styled it Genjo Koan, two words with a space. And this is uh, not to contradict Kozan, but to add to, to the, the meaning of Genjo Koan, because in his gloss, he did it as one word, Genjo Koan, one kind of word. And as you can see, there's one word, Genjo Koan, there's two words. So there's no right way to do it. Of course, Kaz does it as two words. So that's kind of how I knew it, or how I always thought of it. And, um, and so I put it that way because that's what my memory had, like, oh, Genjo Koan, and naively, you know, before I even knew what it was about, I thought it was what kind of koan? A genjo koan, you know? Like this means koan, like a public case or a, one of these Zen stories, these uh, perplexing questions um, that, you know, Zen practitioners study to get enlightened, right? So it's like, oh, the genjo koan, it must be like the ultimate koan. And, uh, and though that um, interpretation doesn't have a lot of uh, support in these, in this kind of tradition, in the Soto, really in the Soto lineage, and I'll read a quote backing that up. It does have some, uh, some meaning in other traditions, and I think it's a worthwhile exploration. What would a Genjo koan mean? So, I mean, and I'll just say, in the Chinese and the Japanese, of course, Genjo koan, there's no spaces. It's just all the letters are just, all the characters are just there. So it's really an, an, an interpretive thing, how you take it. Is it one word? Is it two words? Is it four words? So uh, in, not in these books, in the Shobo Genzo, in Kaz's translation, or, or um, he edited the Shobo Genzo, the Treasury of the True Dharma Eye by Dogen, he says about this word in the, he kind of has prefaces to the fascicles at the beginning of the book, which are really interesting. So he says there about this fascicle, koan, 
The original word for fundamental point in the title usually means an exemplary Zen story given by the teacher to student for spiritual investigation. But Dogen uses the word here to point to the reality of all things that is to be realized. So there's that take on it too. And so as Kozan mentioned, calling it the fundamental point is perhaps poetic. It's like, but it exactly means that. It's like right on, hits the nail on the head. And um, I think as Kozan also mentioned, which is from this book, Realizing Genjo Koan, uh, Okumura says that this phrase Genjo Koan shows up 25 times in the Shobo Genzo. The word Genjo by itself shows up 300 times. It was kind of woven through the fabric of the Shobo Genzo. And uh, I think he also said it was Dogen's one word, you know, his one true word of Zen. Like some people had the whisk and some people had the fist. Kozan said this and Dogen had Genjo Koan. And, uh, and so I think it's really worth looking at what does that mean? What's our Genjo Koan here? So Koan as Koan though, Genjo Koan, the Genjo Koan. Uh, in, in this book, again, this is a, this is a Genjo Koan study book from 96, edited by Kaz Tanahashi Sensei and uh, Taigen Dan Layton. And I don't know if it ever turned into a book, but it's got, I only have the first 75 pages of 250, which glosses word for word with meanings, the whole Genjo Koan. So it's a really cool way, especially, you know, Chinese, to kind of look and be like, oh, that's what that, that's how that works. Um, and this is on our resources page for the session, which is accessible to everyone who registers. So in this book, um, and he, they, they go through all of the, the, all of the uh, characters, and then they also have like seven or eight different translations from different authors about Genjo Koan. So it's a really cool comparative study. So one of the things I just happened to flip to on C64 of this book, it's from He Jim Kim's Flowers of Emptiness, which is a commentary in different parts of uh, the Shobu Genzo. And I thought this was just right on. He says, the word koan is said in the exposition of Chung Feng Ming Pen to denote the case records of the public law court and thus suggests those principles and laws which make the world upright and orderly. Etymologically, this interpretation may be accurate. It is it has been widely accepted in connection with the old paradigm koan, the kosoku koan. So this is the sense of koan when you read like the Blue Cliff Record and Gateless Gate. And here's where he talks about this tradition. In the Japanese Soto tradition, however, another interpretation given by Sene in his Kikigaki has been equally influential. So Sene was Dogen's student, as Kozan mentioned. According to this interpretation, the ko and koan refers to fairness and identity, where like equality, and on suggest apportionment and differentiation, so each in its own place. In this view, the word koan signifies the non-dual oneness of identity and differentiation, of, of, non -dual, of, of emptiness and form of one and all. So it's the sandokai, the harmony of relative and absolute, the identity of relative and absolute. That's what koan means in that Soto line. And I think that's totally, that's gotta be right, right? I mean, Dogen said it to Sene who said it to all the people down the line. But what if it means a koan, <laughs> koan, koan? And I love that koan has become, in our modern culture, its own word. It's probably in the dictionary. Some perplexing statement, some question, some deep thing gnawing at our heart, what is meaningful to us that we haven't resolved, some unresolved thing, a koan. So, you know, one example of a koan in modern culture, the ultimate question concerning life, the universe, and everything. Does anyone know that phrase? 42. 42. But what's 42? Also a koan, <laughs> right? The answer is the koan, is the question. And that's what's so fascinating is a koan isn't just something you answer and then it's like, oh, it's done, right? A koan and why we have these texts, the Blue Cliff Record, Gateless Gate, um, Iron Flute, Book of Equanimity, and the Denkaroka, the transmission of the lamp, those are like the five kind of traditional koan collections that people study. You don't like get an answer and, and write it down and then you're done. I mean, I guess in some kind of ways of practicing them, you can do that. But really, they're, they're, you can just keep exploring them forever. Somebody can sit with 
one koan their whole life and never exhaust it. So taking it in this way, I would translate, I could, you could translate Genjo Koan as actualizing the fundamental question. Actualizing the fundamental question for you, I think it has to be, because there's no one question. So, I mean, what is our fundamental question? How do we touch in with that? What does that mean for us? You know, often uh, in practice interviews, you hear people say, my practice is dry. I'm just watching my breath, but not really sure if it's working and my mind wanders a lot. I'm kind of lost my inspiration. And um, I often ask someone who says something like that, well, why are you practicing? What's your reason for being here? What's your intention? That's kind of the the phrase we use, what's your motivation? Because motivation is totally key to our practice, knowing why we're sitting, or at least, you know, having an eye towards that. Maybe we don't know, maybe it's not like, I'm sitting to do this. Maybe it's like, I'm not sure why I'm sitting, but I'm interested in learning more. It's this kind of forward-leaning attitude. We're not just sitting back and being like, well, I don't remember why I'm here, but I'm, I was told to be here, so. I'm just showing up, you know, it's like, maybe there's a place for that. But I feel like, especially when you're feeling like you're hitting a wall, or you're just not sure, to touch back into whatever your fundamental question is, is really critical. Fundamental question, fundamental reason. And uh, so a koan in this sense, of discovering your own koan, maybe could be helpful. And as we go into Sashin tonight, and tomorrow morning as we're sitting, you know, I feel like I'm on fire. I'm just <laughs> so excited to hear Kozan's Orioki instruction and kind of back in the, that form. And we're all going to, you know, we're going to be like strict and keep our eyes down and not look at each other. It's a, it's a totally different experience of relating. It's like deeply intimate because we're not relating on personality. We don't have to, you know, smile and hi and how are you? It's just like you're in that space and you know other people are in that space. And so you're supporting each other in that. And we'll talk about that more tonight, or Kozan will. And, um, and so when we're in that, you know, this is just another way to think about practice. Because we've got mindfulness of breathing, we've got, you know, just staying with your body, we've got posture. And, uh, and so something else that you might drop in, if it calls to you, is this sense of koan, a sense of sitting with a question, a sense of inquiry. Vipassana. We had a conversation about shamatha vipassana the other day, which I might mention later. And so um, I thought in talking about koans, let's see, do I have a, okay. Um, Dogen in Genjo Koan actually talks about a koan, one of the classic, well, it's kind of classic. I couldn't find the, the Baucha fanning himself koan in any of the regular koan collections. I don't know if anybody knows where that was originally from. It also shows up in Dogen's 300 case Shobogenzo, which is his other Shobogenzo, um, and which is a koan collection that he compiled from earlier sources. So it must have come from somewhere. And of course, there's not just the five books of koans. There's thousands, probably, of koan collections that we're only aware of a few. So in his case 123, it's pretty much the same as in the Shobogenzo version, in the Genjo koan version. But uh, he has a, a little commentary and a verse. So I thought I'd just read this. And this is like, just to get a feel, okay, this is what koan is in a kind of classic sense. This is a koan for Dogen. And, um, and then how, to, how can we make this real for us? So Zen master Baucha of Mount Mayu was fanning himself. A monk approached and said, Master, the nature of wind is permanent and there is no place it does not reach. Why then do you fan yourself? Master says, although you understand that the nature of wind is permanent, you do not understand the meaning of its reaching everywhere. The monk asked, what is the meaning of its reaching everywhere? The master just kept fanning himself. So this is right at the end of the Genjo Koan fascicle, and Dogen says, the actualization, continuing from this, the actualization of the Buddha Dharma, 
the vital path of its authentic transmission is like this. If you say that you do not need to fan yourself because the nature of wind is permanent and you can have wind without fanning, you understand neither permanence nor the nature of wind. Now that makes sense, right? That's one of those koans that's maybe a little easier to, like it makes sense on a, on a kind of a normal level, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's, it's the, the monk, I, I feel it in myself, that kind of tendency to want to just kind of explain and to analyze and to kind of be clever. It's like, why are you fanning yourself? The nature of wind is permanent, right? And the master just is like, oh God, <laughs> you don't get it. And he's like, okay, well then tell me, you know, like, show me your stuff, master. You know, and it's actually the right answer, right? He just doesn't even want to answer, but he gave the right answer because it's not that the nature of wind is everywhere it means that everything is being fanned. It means that you can fan, but it still requires the activity. Um, but without that nature of wind being wind, fanning wouldn't work. So, I mean, this seems so obvious, but it never struck me before until I was preparing for this talk that this koan is Dogen's koan. Do you know Dogen's fundamental question? Why did he travel to China? Why was he in search of a teacher? Because I mentioned it. Who can remember? Why did he go? Anyone want to try? Looking for an authentic Dharma. Yes. They have a very specific question. Why this if this? If, if something like if the nature of who the nature is always with you, then why do you have to go search in far away places? Yeah, yeah. It's something like if that. if right, if we're already enlightened, if Buddha nature is within us, why do we have to practice? Right? Why search far and wide to find what you already are? Okay. And it's like that's exactly isn't that this koan? The nature is winded everywhere. Why do you have to fan yourself? And so Mayu, uh, Master Baucha of Mount Mayu, fanning himself, practice realization. There it is. It's already, the nature of wind's already there. It doesn't change. But the fanning, the activity, is required for the manifestation of that nature. I just thought that was really cool. So, but that, again, is a kind of explan explanatory way of looking at it. And I don't think that's all there is to this koan. Again, I think you could go into this koan forever, as with all koans. So he says, in his commentary in the 300 koan, Shobogenzo, Dogen says, If you have realized the truth of this koan, you will know that to encounter one activity is to practice one activity. To attain one dharma is to penetrate one dharma. If, however, this is not yet clear, then take the backward step and see for yourself how Mayu's fanning himself is not only the wind reaching everywhere, but the fan, Mayu, the monastic, and you yourself reaching everywhere. That's a different feeling. It's not, oh yeah, the nature of wind is permanent, so I, you know, I, have, to wave, I have to wave my fan to feel it. Got it. Like, no, it's the nature reaches, you know, all of us reach everywhere. It's like this, it's this kind of mind-blowing, non-separation feeling. That's when you penetrate the koan. You might feel something like that, right? And so what do you do? How do you do it? Take the backward step. See for yourself. Plunge into a koan. Wave the fan. Look at it from different angles. You know, you could do it analytically or you could just drop it into your body and what is Mayu's fanning? What is Bauch's, then Master Bauch's fanning himself? And um, just like in, in being, being with Dying, they do this, or in chaplaincy too, they do this repeating question. You just ask the same question over and over again. And it's like you think, well, what, what new could come of it? But anybody that's done that practice knows every time you answer the question, again and again, it's a different answer. Right? You're trying for a different answer, but there's always more to come up. So it's like that, sitting with the question. And so I think this is either whether we take a koan from one of the collections, and we're like, this is really speaking to me, and I want to sit with this, or we're just, what is important to you? You know, what is it that you want to know? Who am I? Like many of you went on the wilderness fast with that question. Who am I? That's like maybe the kind of main koan, right? The basis of all koans. 
what is this? Who am I? That could be your question. Or if you're more, um, you know, it could be more like, why is there so much suffering in the world? Or how can I truly serve to alleviate suffering? Whatever is, is of utmost important to you, that I feel you must be connected with when you sit. And Roshi talks about in her teaching uh, on, um, on grace, the first step is gather your attention. The second step is recall, intention. recall your intention. Recall your intention. And that's your motivation. And in the classic Mahayana sense, it's to cultivate bodhicitta, to cultivate the aspiration to awaken for the sake and benefit of all beings. And, um, but she says when you're doing that, if you're going to cultivate the Mahayana attention, you really need to feel it. So what does it take to feel that in your heart and not just say, I'm going to wake up to save all beings, but to feel it, whether it's you know, imagining a suffering being you know, someone who really needs help, can you send them some metta? Can you feel it in your heart? Compassion is, is to witness and empathize with another who's suffering and to wish that they're free from it. It has two components. If it's just empathy and you just feel it and there's no kind of wish to, to save them, you can have um, empathic overarousal and it goes into all kinds of bad stuff. But if you have this desire to help, which creates, you know, which makes it compassion, that's powerful. And books have been written of it, including Roshi Jones, um, standing at the edge. And, and so if compassion is your goal, to really touch it and feel it, I think you, you do some practice to feel it. And there are classic practices. But also any of those uh, kinds of questions that I mentioned, something that ties you from your, your vast aspiration, your vast motivation, to your cushion. How does sitting on this cushion during this session, taking this time that you could be doing anything, and now you're doing basically nothing. And yes, we don't want to practice with a mind of acquiring and grasping. That's kind of one level. And we also will only do this if there's something in it for us. There's part of us that feels that way. And so for that part of us, and we have both parts, so it's like, great. So the absolute part, just sit to sit. And there are times when you can just drop into that. But if your mind's just going and you're like, oh, why am I here and I don't want to do this, then the part of you is active that needs something to go for. It needs the carrot at the end of the stick. And rather than giving it any carrot, any random carrot, maybe it won't bite, ask it what it wants. So what is important to you? Why are you sitting? You want to be free from anger? You want your mind to stop? Why do you want your mind to stop? What's wrong with your mind going? Doesn't it produce lots of pleasurable sensations? Well, mostly, apparently, according to <laughs> the research, daydreaming or mind wandering is like 80% or 90% negative thinking. So that's something by itself. If you want to be happier, watch your mind. You know, stop mind wandering so much. So whatever it is, I think, come back to that on the cushion. I'm creating a spacious awareness. And if I have this question, well, I really want to know who I am. I think it will help me and other people to not be reifying myself. I'm such and such a person that's better or worse than other people. You know, this kind of notion of self, I think, I, I do believe, is the cause of you know, most of our problems in the world. So I want to, I want to look at that. And I've heard things about it you know, being not true. Well, I feel like I'm myself. So is it true? I need to know this. I really need to know this. Who am I? And so, you know, you kind of can cultivate this sense of importance for why we're sitting, why we're doing what we're doing. And then you let it go. You know, you can arouse the question. It's not to keep hammering on the question over and over again and thinking about it analytically. That can have a part. But the important thing, I think, is once you've kind of like remembered, recalled your intention, then you go to the A of grace, attune, attune to self, attune to other, attune to the world. So then attuning is listening, right? Then you listen. You open up. You open the hand of thought, as Uchiyama Roshi says. Cultivate your motivate or cultivate or, or recall your intention, your motivation. Open. And then you'll have traction in your practice, right? 
and this is something I've I heard uh, teachers say, traction is the opposite of. That true, true. Distraction, right? So what's our what's our problem all the time? We're distracted, right? How do we get not distracted? Traction. How do you gain traction? Intention. The glue that binds. The sashin means to gather the mind and heart, to gather the heart mind. That glue that gathers that magnetic field is intention. It is your genjo koan. That's what gathers the mind. What is important to you? Suzuki Roshi said, the most important thing is to know what is the most important thing, right? I was like, well, what does that mean? It means to recall your intention. Why are you here? And keep remembering every time you sit down, and I have to remind myself this all the time, but I think it's really is the most important thing to remember why we're here. And Roshi says it every time she does a guided meditation. Why really are you here? So, why are we here? I think enough said about that. I'll close with Shohaku Okamura from this book. He says, when thoughts, judgments, or evaluations arise in Zazen, and we engage with them, there is separation between subject and object. When we let go of thought, subject and object are one. There is no one to evaluate and nothing to receive evaluation. At that time, only manifesting reality exists, and manifesting reality includes our delusions. When we sit in the upright posture, keeping the eyes open, breathing through the nose, and letting go of thoughts, reality manifests itself. This is Genjo Koan, actualization of reality. So I hope as we enter this session tonight, all of you will have a taste of Genjo Koan, your own Genjo Koan, as it must be, and perhaps the fundamental Genjo Koan that Dogen's talking about. So thank you all for joining us. And for those of you on, on YouTube and, and Zoom, thank you. And for those of you in the session, we'll see you tonight at 745 for our opening. Roshi Joan and I will do the online opening, and Kozan will do the opening here um, with the residents. And if you're not in the session and would like to join, you may do so at this link. Ding. Thank you all so much.